Welcome Jim Wallace to the stage, and he and Ken Mita will, will treat us to, um, what is that, a, a weaving of words and song. Well, uh, good morning, Wild Goose. You guys awake? You betcha. All right. I feel blessed to be here and back at Wild Goose and very blessed to be with my dear friend, Ken Miedema. We have been on the road together all over the world many times. We do this thing called um, Let Justice Roll. Heard that one before? And we riff back and forth. I do a little riff, he does one. And just so you know who this is, Ever heard of Bruce Coburn, the folk singer? Bruce Coburn and Noel Paul Stuckey tell me that he is the best improvisational musician they've ever heard. And they're right. So you're gonna hear this for the next 50 minutes. Now, some of you have heard me say this weekend that my transition was, I didn't retire, I just rewired at Georgetown. So that's what I've done. And at Georgetown, uh, while I still speak to churches and church groups and conferences and seminaries, I also speak to a lot of secular gatherings, meetings, conferences, and my students, who basically are not sure what they're practicing when it comes to religion. They may not be practicing at all, but they're there overflowing in the classes, in the events, every day. And when I speak to secular gatherings, I often start with this. You're gonna hear some words that sound religious some terms, some phrases, which will evoke in you a lot of feelings, experiences that you might call disappointing, hurtful, maybe even wounding, betraying, or may even feel like an assault on you from religion. Now, if we had time, I tell them, we could tell those stories, but we haven't got that kind of time. So let me take a moment, I often say, just to acknowledge all those stories. Hurt, betrayal, woundedness, with a moment of silence, which we often do. And in that moment of silence, they take a breath and relax. And just acknowledging is a very healing moment. And then we get back to what, in fact, religion, faith could be. <laughs> but you gotta start by saying what it has been for a lot of people. Now, you all are doing that all weekend here, acknowledging the stories, hearing your stories, and that's a very healing thing. Many, many of my students are in the none of the above category, the nuns, as they say, which is not a part which is not a conference of secularization. They're not secular. Most believe in God. They just don't want to affiliate with religion for reasonable reasons. So we're acknowledging that today. We've taken a breath. And I want to um, get to what religion, faith could be must be and needs to be at this moment in American history. Stephen Harris, my colleague who's here with me from the center, yesterday talked about how the black church began when black slaves heard the book. <laughs> they heard their slave masters, the book, and they looked around and they said, now this isn't right. This isn't right, what's going on here isn't right. And they went off to what he calls in 
black historians call the Hush Harbors. The Hush Harbors, where they found what was in the book. And I said to him yesterday, it's interesting that the Hush Harbors, where the black church was founded by the slaves a long time ago, those Hush Harbors produced the American church that had more impact on the rest of the world than any other American church, the black churches. Trust the hush harbors. He said yesterday, Stephen, maybe Wild Goose is a hush harbor. Maybe it is. So we're going to go to the book. Go to the book and find a way forward. I said yesterday, three things are at stake kind of everything right now, democracy itself is at stake. It will be decided in the next three years, period. The next three years will decide whether this unfinished democracy continues or whether it's stopped, just stopped. Secondly, faith is at stake. Because if faith comes down on the wrong side of this, that will be really the ending of a lot of religion as we know it for a long time. Third, a new generation who I'm with every day, which I love, is at stake because if religion comes down on the right side of this battle for democracy, a lot of them are going to come back. Trust me, they're going to come back. They're ready. But if we don't, they're gone. They're gone for the rest of their lives. So, Wild Goose is often a place where we talk about what's wrong with religion. Rightly so. What's wrong? What doesn't work? What's hurtful? I want to flip it this morning. Flip it. I want to talk about how this moment, this moment where all that's wrong is wrong, this moment could become a movement, historic one in American history. So, Ken, here we go. I'm going to do six quick, iconic texts that I would say, do you believe it or not? (laughs) Do you believe these texts or not? If you don't believe it, say so. Don't use them. Don't talk about them. But if you believe it, you got to apply them right now. Okay, number one, Genesis 1.26. I mentioned this briefly yesterday. First book of the Bible. All the noise that I hear all the time. I was on calls all day yesterday. NAAC, Legal Defense Fund, Secretary of State of Michigan. All the noise about voting rights. But in the middle of Genesis chapter one, I love this. I take a breath and I read, then God said... Despite the noise, then God said, let us create humankind in our own image, after our own likeness. And God did that. Made all of us. I told the Secretary of State in Pennsylvania, made all Pennsylvanians in the image of God. So whether they're allowed to vote is not a political issue, a parson issue. It's a religious issue. It's an Imago Dei issue. And I said to that Republican state senator, I mean state, Secretary of State, so to suppress a vote because of the color of one's skin is throwing Imago Dei in the toilet. You're a Christian, right? I said, yep. You get that? Yep. So that's what's at stake here, Mr. Secretary. We are beginning an Imago Dei movement, and I gotta tell you, I'm on these calls. We got clergy, black, white, Latino, Asian American, rabbis, imams. We haven't had this kind of gathering at any time since the civil rights movement, never before. Here we are all together in 10 states on calls every week. We haven't had this since the civil rights movement. So this is the Imago Dei movement and the Imago Dei is lifted up in every meeting. This text is where we start. At the end of our time here, I'm gonna make an altar call for poll chaplains. 
to go to all those states and stop what is now a campaign for voter sabotage in this nation. So, the Imago Day movement is something that is bringing us together, Ken, for voting rights. What would you do if you were a picture? If you were a picture of God. What would you do if you were a look-alike? A look-alike to more mighty God. Where would you run? Where would you walk? What would you do and how would you talk? What would you do if you were looking just like God? Well, let me tell you what you are. Yeah, what would you do if you had God's power? What would you do if you had God's heart? What would you do if you had God's compassion? What would you do if you were a maker of God's art? Where would you go? Where would you walk? What would you say? And baby, how would you talk? What would you do if you were looking just like God? Let me tell you what you Boy, I miss that, Ken. I miss that. So these secretaries of state all believe they're Christians, when you ask. Or maybe they're Jews. And you say, okay, here's this text. Here's this text. Do you believe it or not? Second text, Luke 10, 25, 37. It's really cool that right, we're right here next to the Jericho Road. I mean, Jericho Road, right? How could I not talk about Jericho Road? So here we are. This is a lawyer who comes to see Jesus. And he says, so what do I do to inherit eternal life? Tell me how to do this. Jesus, well, you love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind. And then here is the double love commandment in all of our traditions, Christian, Jewish, Muslim. And you love your neighbor as yourself. So the lawyer asked a question, and the tone of his voice convinces me he's a Washington lawyer. <laughs> he doesn't say, oh, who is my neighbor? Let me welcome him. He's, All right, exactly, who is my neighbor? Let's be specific here. What are the boundaries? Who are we talking about? Who, exactly who is mine? This is a Washington lawyer. So Jesus, for his example of how to love your neighbor, picks the Samaritan. Now, let me be clear. The Judeans of Jesus' time didn't think there were any good Samaritans. They didn't like the Samaritans. They were a mixed race. They were other. They were dangerous. Stay away from them. Too risky. So Jesus picks a Samaritan who is an other to this lawyer. And the story is the Samaritan helps somebody who's other than him. Think about it, Jericho Road. Guy's been beaten and robbed, laying by the roadside. He's got to take his time, his energy, ultimately his money. And he's risking because... This is a tough, if you haven't read Dr. King's sermon on the Jericho Road, you should read it. Dangerous place. He's risking himself. Maybe the guys are still around. Now the religious leaders, they pass by because they had an important summer synod to attend. A meeting, they pass by, they weren't. But the Samaritan stops and he helps them. And then the story goes on. To show this, I'll be very clear and simple. Jesus says, 
when he picks a Samaritan and the Samaritan picks an other to him, Jesus is saying, pay attention. Your neighbor probably doesn't live in your neighborhood. Think about that. Your neighbor is in your cul-de-sac. The neighbor whom Jesus lives up here is the one who's other than you, who's different than you. And when he sends out the disciples at the end, remember it says, go into Samaria and all the world. We mistakenly think, oh, Samaria, that must just be, you know, a place on the way to the rest of the world. Nope. Samaria is the place of the others. The others. So these Jewish disciples of Jesus, to go into the world, they've got to go through Samaria. They've got to go through the place of the others. Come to terms with the others. Because this movement Jesus is sending them out to is about how to embrace and include the others. In a democracy, as John Meacham keeps saying over and over again, John Meacham, the historian, used to say, it's bad, it's dangerous, but we're resilient. Our institution, he's not saying that now. John is nervous. Meacham is nervous about whether we're gonna survive. And what he says is this, we gotta learn to treat our adversaries as our neighbors and not our enemies. And Jesus is saying, you gotta figure out your neighbor is not in your neighborhood. How you treat them, how you treat the others is gonna be the test of faith and democracy. So Ken, your neighbor is not in your neighborhood. Yeah. You heard this story already. You're gonna hear it again. One damn trouble with those Samaritans. They ain't been neighbor trained. You got to train your kids very well. How to let go and how to hold it, you see. But trouble with those Samaritans is that they ain't been neighbor trained. Train your kids to hold it. Not to let it go Spread their love like poop all around It's a bad thing, don't you know? Yep, that's the trouble with Samaritans And I'll tell you once again They just spread it all over Like they ain't got no sense Cause they ain't been neighbor trained Nope, they ain't been neighbor trained. Well, they ain't been neighbor trained. Yeah. Love the neighbor outside your neighborhood. Believe it or not. There you go. Very simple. Third text, Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed, it's a beatitude, you'll recognize it. Blessed are the peacemakers, and this is unique. Jesus, for they shall be called the children of God. The peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. He says nice things about all the others, but these peacemakers called the children of God. Blessed are the peace lovers, says Jesus, because you're all peace lovers. That's cool, that's fine. No, no, no. Blessed are the peacemakers, because peace lovers, are, they're, all, they're really all for the good stuff. We're for the good, we write apologies and all that. We say all the good stuff. Peacemaking is hard stuff. It's dirty stuff. It's risky stuff. My friend Daniel Berrigan once said, you know why the war makers win over the peacemakers? 
because the war makers are more committed. They make war in ways that are costly. The peacemakers just talk about what they're for and what they're against. What does costly peacemaking mean? It doesn't mean right now because I want to tell you, we, hear this carefully now, we are at the nearest place in America to the Civil War since the 1860s. Since the 1860s, we are now at the nearest place to a civil war. Political violence is on the rise. So when Donald Trump tried all his stuff to stay in office, well, we'll say it was fraud, and, but then all of the judges and courts that he appoints said, no, no, it was fair. Oh, okay. Well, let's get all the state election officials to just turn things around. I'll call my Republican friends who are state. No, we're not going to do that. We, what do you mean? I just need 11,840 votes. We're not going to do that. Well, that didn't work. Then he had false certified electors sent from all the states. Well, that, that, that didn't work. Then I can get Mike Pence to, to overturn this or at least delay it uh, in the Senate on the big day, which is normally a ceremonial day that nobody pays attention to, and send it back to the states and then maybe get thrown to the Supreme Court if the Congress gets decided. Mike Pence, Mike Pence, do it, Mike, do it, Mike. <laughs> and even Mike Pence wouldn't do it. They put up a noose for Mike Pence. Hang Mike Pence. He had a lot invested in Mike Pence doing what Mike Pence had always done to say and do whatever Donald Trump wanted. But this time, he didn't do it. And you probably didn't see much media coverage of this. But they asked one of Mike Pence's legal aides what he did that night when he got home after this day of January 6th, when his boss could have been hung. Well, I, I went to prayer, and I went to the scriptures, and I went to Daniel 6. So I read it. Daniel in the lion's den. On that day, you can say Mike Pence should have said this months ago. That's fine. But on the day when he needed to say what had to be said. He said no to the king and he got put in the lion's den. But that didn't work. Mike Pence didn't go along with it. So finally, if you're following these carefully, I'm, as you can expect, glued to them. Finally, in the end, they had this big meeting where, where uh, Rudy Giuliani and uh, all these crazy lawyers had six hours in the Oval screaming and yelling with Trump's lawyers about um, appointing her to be the official in charge of elections and seize the voting machines because uh, uh, there were former, there were dead dictators in Venezuela who were behind this thing. So the crazies got their last moment in the White House. Uh, and it didn't work. They didn't prevail. Right after that, right after that failed meeting, when all of his stuff had run out, Trump did a tweet. And get this carefully, Donald Trump aligned all the unaligned militia and white supremacist groups in the country who weren't together until he brought them together to be his mob to come to Washington. Finally, in the end, fascism does everything it can to gain power, and then it goes for political violence. That's where we are, and we're still there. So what does it mean to be peacemakers <laughs> in a time like that? What does it mean to get ready, and my friends, I'm saying, train ourselves for the civil war that's likely coming. Eddie Glaude says, um, we've been in a cold civil war for a long time. It could get hot. 
so we could see political violence like we haven't seen before in our lifetimes. And Jesus says, okay, you're gonna be the peacemakers. Risky, dirty, frightening, nasty. I think we need to train thousands of people of faith to be peacemakers and conflict resolvers in what could be an oncoming some kind of civil war. As a little bit of God in the office of the city commission. As a little bit of God marching on the city streets. As a little bit of God standing up there in Washington. As a little bit of God marching with weary feet. There's a little bit of God taking the risk to go and face an enemy. There's a little bit of God trying to start a talk. There's a little bit of God taking risks hardly ever got taken before. There's a little bit of God who dares to take the walk. And that little bit of God who's making peace when it's all oh so hard to do. That little bit of God looks a heaven of a lot like you. Nobody should predict civil war. Nobody should want civil war. This one won't be with tanks. It'll be acts of violence. We don't know yet, but what we're facing is something that we will need trained, committed, risk-taking peacemakers for like no time in our lifetimes. It's about a getting ready time. Because here's the sequence. Fear, hate, violence. They create fear of the others. That leads to hate and that justifies the violence. Fear, hate, and violence. So those of us who believe in that beatitude, that text, it's time for us to get ready for whatever comes because in the midst of a second American civil war of whatever it is like, blessed will be the peacemakers for they'll be called the children of God. So then, well, there's this text in John 8. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, Jesus is just saying here, like your mom told you, don't lie. Lying's bad. No, not saying that. Be a truth teller because good people, that's what we do. We, no, he's saying there's a deep connection between truth telling and captivity. Truth telling and freedom. Only the truth can set us free. Only the truth can set us free. I mean, I'm old enough to remember in the old days of the Watergate hearings, America all had the same question. What did he, Nixon, know and when did he know it? Same question, we watched the news every night, all of us, 
at our dinner tables on three networks. <laughs> and those guys would tell us what the latest was. What did he know? When did he know? And the Supreme Court forced Nixon to release the tapes that recorded that he knew and covered it up. So right away, Barry Goldwater, of all people, went and said, you're done, go home. Now, there's no three networks to watch over dinner. There's every kind of cable television station, and they all have very strong ideological agendas. And my kids tell me they don't even watch any of that stuff. It's all websites. It's all, it's all on the internet. It's all places people go. And there are whole websites devoted to conspiracy theories, devoted to misinformation. The shooter in Evalde found his community among fellow shooters and fellow wannabe shooters at their sites on the internet. They find their places and their sites that tell all kinds of untruth that makes us all captive, makes us all unfree. Only the truth can make us free. I've, Joel Hunter, who was one of the first megachurch pastors, come a long way since then in Florida. He, see, he told me years ago, he said, I, I got my people two hours a day if I'm lucky. Fox News has them 24 seven. I can't compete. Pastors, some of your pastors, you're afraid of truth telling, right? Because, you know, you could lose your pension, you could lose your job, you could lose your constituency. And pastors call me and say, my life just got threatened by a parishioner. Because I said that vac vaccines are good. What's at stake is freedom. And Jesus knew that. What does it mean to be truth tellers when what's at stake is the freedom of even our parishioners, our communities, our nation? This may be the toughest text I'm going to give you today because I don't have all the answers to this one or the other ones either, but this one is, what does it mean to prepare our pastors and faith leaders with the strength and the ability and the courage and the, in, the information to tell the truth? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if in the midst of all the, the parallel universe sources of truth, right? We're living in a world of parallel universes. And if somebody says something and you say, well, the New York Times says this, that constitution says, well, I know that's a lie then. <laughs> just because it's the New York Times. The, the day is over when you can say, well, have you listened to Rachel Maddow? It's not gonna do it, folks. What would it mean for our faith communities to be in the truth-telling business in the days ahead? The one place where people could come and find the truth and hear it courageously in this faith united to save democracy, this big coalition that I'm part of. We had this wonderful new member to our Georgia group, Presbyterian woman, young woman, just moved into Georgia. She said, yeah, well, I'm in this Presbyterian church and, and this is just gospel. This is just gospel, truth telling gospel. So I'm just gonna tell the truth. That's gospel. People don't like it, they can leave. That's gospel. She's, she's young. <laughs> but I love that. It's just truth-telling gospel. I'm a pastor. I tell the truth, right? Now, here's a really great story. Jim Simpson, my executive director at the center, his father is a Scottish Presbyterian who took a church in Georgia, which brought his family here. And his father still sounds like a Scottish Presbyterian. Now, in the little church in the South, his mother 
<laughs> is in the church choir. Of course, pastor's wife is in the church choir. And they practiced before every Sunday morning service. And they did one Sunday morning service. And um, after the practice, the church choir director says a prayer. Typical, says a prayer. So she begins on this day to say a prayer. After the practice, she says, Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, protect us from those dangerous cartels that are full of immigrants and that are coming. They're coming. They're co this woman is not a right-wing person, not a political person. She's the choir director, and she's scared. They're coming, these cartels, and they're bringing diseases, and they're bringing leprosy. Now, listen now. Leprosy is not a well-known disease anymore unless you're a Bible person. And so they're bringing leprosy. Oh, I know that one. They're bringing leprosy and diseases and guns and these cartels, and they're coming after us. Lord, they're coming after us. And pray for the military to stop them from coming. So my, Jim Simpson's mother, my dear friend's my mother, stops the prayer. Stop, stop, stop. That's all lies, and we don't lie in church. Sorry, stop, stop, stop. That's all lies, and we don't lie in church. Don't lie here, sorry. Uh, it kind of stopped the prayer. We don't tell lies in church, because if you know the truth, only the truth will set you free. You may lose your job And you may lose your friends All your hopes and dreams for your life May come to a sudden end You could lose it all You could lose it all if you decide to tell the truth and follow the holy call out on the street out of the church you got the boot last week Just because you open your mouth and you dare to speak. But if we're going to have the truth, some of us going to lose our jobs. If we're going to have the truth, in this world some of us get hit by the mob so choose your friends most carefully because when you finally get kicked out you need to know where to go for some assistance Cause that's what friends are all about And don't be scared to be kicked out Text 5 my conversion text, Matthew 25. So I got kicked out of my little church, my little white evangelical church as a teenage kid in Detroit, over the issue of race. And so I got free, set free. They didn't want, didn't want me, I didn't want them. So I was a secular young activist in the movements of my time in Michigan. But this text brought me back to Jesus, or brought me to him, for the first time. And I was a Marxist, 
Well, some nights we were anarchists, <laughs> Marxist anarchists. I was all that. Uh, but I wasn't satisfied by the answers I was getting from Marxism or anarchism about what I could build my life on. I knew I wanted to be an activist and not to change the world, but I needed some foundation, some, some basis for that. I wasn't sure I was getting it from what I was reading. So probably because I was from that background, I could never quite get shed of Jesus. <laughs> so after we shut down Michigan State University, my university, in 1970, uh, those were big days, tear gas, bullets, death threats in your dorm room at night. <laughs> I went back to Jesus. It wasn't because of any Christians. I wasn't talking to them. And I found this text, most radical thing I ever read, ever, still. This is the it was me text. I was hungry. Yup, they cut food stamps again. My family, they cut the child tax credit again and my family is hungry. Yeah, that was me. I was thirsty. Yeah, we were in Flint. We didn't have any water to drink. Yeah, that was me. I was naked. I was in Guatemala, my family, and the drug cartels were coming in. They said they're going to enlist my boy in the army and gang rape my girl, and I couldn't raise food on my land because of the climate changes. So I stripped of everything, and we, we walked to the United States where we could get asylum. We walked, and we got there, and they put us in cages, and they took my kids away. Yep, that was me. I was a stranger. The word means immigrant there. I was a stranger, and, and, and they didn't welcome me. I was sick. They decided yesterday, Joe Manchin again decided, let me be political, to not let Medicaid health care expand. He did it again. So two million people would have gotten expanded health care, mostly black and brown. Nope, that was me, says Jesus. I was in prison. <laughs> yeah, like, more black people in prison in our incarceration system now than during slavery. Yep, that was me. It's the, it was me text. As you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. That text brought me to faith, it still does. It taught me that my worldview is changed when I'm in places I was never supposed to be with people I was never supposed to know or meet or hear their stories. That is still my conversion text. But we can't just conclude that those who don't care for the poor are going to hell. That is what the text says, by the way. It's a judgmental text. I want to flip it and say, it's where you find Jesus. <laughs> Among those who are the least of these, he's saying, I'm there. I'm here. You want to find me? Look there. So yesterday, you don't know this, but I am a Trekkie. I'm a Star Trek guy. Have been since college. And I went to Chase Masterson yesterday, who was leader in Deep Space Nine, right? I love meeting her. I got her autograph. That's how much Star Trek means to me. Here's what she said when she was drinking and depressed and down. Someone said to her, go find somebody else who's worse off than you. It bolted her out of bed. And she found my friend Greg Boyle, Jesuit, California, LA, homeboys. He works with gangsters, former gangsters in LA. And she found Jesus. <laughs> and that's got this thing called pop hero culture. It's very cool. They're doing anti-bullying thing. Bullying, racism, misogyny, LBGTQ bullying, all of that. She's doing this, she got a mission now, because she found Jesus. That's a big deal. Or once a pastor chaplain at a, at a a Christian college, 
I spoke there, and he got fired because he had me speak. <laughs> he got fired, lost his job. So I was sorry, I got the guy to lose his job, and so I called him a while later and said, I'm sorry, I caused you to lose your job. He says, no, 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 I lost a job, but I kept driving under this bridge where all these homeless people were, and I wondered if they needed the church. So heck, I just kind of moved in and we built a church, and it's a church of the homeless. Jim, I'm closer to Jesus than I've ever been before. Thanks for getting me kicked out of my job. Don't just tell the people who don't care about the poor, they're going to hell. That is what the text says. They should read that. But say, this is how we find Jesus again, by going and being with the poorest and most vulnerable. Taking a walk, making a change, everything now be rearranged daring and dare dreaming a dream taking a walk across the broken seams into the city into the streets taking that walk on weary feet you're going to turn out quite all right. Let's take that walk tonight. Just take that walk tonight. Last text. I'm going to read this one straight out. Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. How many times have you heard that text repeated it? Yeah, it's something we all believe. Cool text. Well, I didn't know that this text was a baptismal formula in the early church. Baptism is where we go public with faith, right? This they read at every batch. Diana Butler Bass, who's here somewhere, told me that it looks like this text was an early church creed. Maybe even the first church creed. My, my, my. Because what they're saying here is, well, we got this rabbi we follow named Jesus, and he told us, he brings us together. There's these three things. Race, class, and gender. These are what always divide us. And they're always there, all three together. And our job is to break down those barriers. Oh, are we perfect? No, no, we're not. But you know, Jesus said, and Paul now says, your body of Christ, here's what you do. Because of Jesus, here's what you do. What if, imagine... American churches at every baptism said, hey, hey, here's this thing. So there's these divisions of race and class and gender. And what our community does is we overcome them. We tear down the barriers. We bring people together because we're all one in Christ Jesus. And those of you who don't want to do that, go somewhere else. Because this is what we do here. You don't want to do that, you're in the wrong place. Here's what we do. We break down the barriers. You don't want to do that, please go somewhere else. Imagine if the American church was saying that right now. now Jim, go ahead and bring it home. Because time is short. And you got something you got to say, my friend. So go ahead, go ahead and bring it all home. And I'll play behind you like a gospel tune while you bring this holy moment to its end. So here's the altar call. I want to keep your hands up. If you live in North Carolina, raise your hand. Keep your hands up. If you live in Georgia, raise your hand. 
If you live in Florida, raise your hand. If you live in Alabama, raise your hand. Texas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, most of you in the room are in the 10 key states where voters are most vulnerable. There's gonna be intimidation and sabotage and threats at polling places. So we're training poll chaplains. Sounds good, right? To show up with your collars and your robes, if you got them, with all your clergy costumes. Show up, we'll train you, and you'll be a presence. Lawyers and collars, poll chaplains to protect this next election in four months and then in 2024. Practical, you can all do it, just got to show up. So, all the calls in these days, you give a website, right? Turnoutsunday.com, turnoutsunday.com. It's all there, our toolkit's there. Turnoutsunday.com, we want poll chaplains. This is multiracial, multi-faith, and multi-generational. I even got St Stephen Curry helping us here. It's everybody, right? We need you to show up at polling places and we'll train you for it. How many like that? Raise your hands. That's our other call. Show up and put your faith in the action. It's next election right now because everything, Ken, is at stake. Ooh, turn out Sunday is coming soon, oh yeah. Turn out Sunday is coming soon. See you there. Amen? Yeah, let's give each other a hand. Let's stand up to show up. Here we go. Thank you all.